The following program paid for by Rosenberg Financial Group. Providing live finance advice since 1993. It's time for your money with Steve Rosenberg, Sherry Goss, Randy Goss, and Becca Wilton. To participate in today's program, call 478-742-0940 with your financial questions and comments. And now, live from the making studios of News Talk 940 WMAC, it's your money. Good morning, Middle Georgia. It's great to be with you today. This is Randy Goss here with my beautiful bride, Sherry. We are both with Rosenberg Financial Group, as you heard just a few seconds ago. Uh, we are fee-based financial planners. We have offices in Macon and Warner Robins. And if you're looking for a, a financial advisor or if you want somebody to uh, review what you, you have in your, your with your current advisor, give us a call, 478-922-8100. Or you're doing it on your own and you just want to have a, a fact check. Yes. We give uh, complimentary consultations all the time, so just give us a call, and uh, I'd like for you to check out our website at retirerelax.com, and check out the special reports page or something in there for everybody. True so, statement. And uh, when you get to the front page of the website, 10 seconds later, a little pop-up is going to come up, and you know, if you put in your name and your, your email, you'll get put on our email distribution. It just comes out automatically. There are n- nice little things that give you market updates and and educational, educational pieces. Educational stuff. Yeah, so it's really good, and we get lots of compliments on it. So uh, check it out and uh, give and us a call. And if you sign up and you don't like it, you can always stop. Yeah, and just, yes, yeah, so that's right. You just send me an email, and I'll take you right off the list. Okay. Great. All right, let's give you a little market update here. Um, all the the major uh, markets were up. The Dow Jones, you know, is over th- uh, 33,000. The S&P's up uh, over 4,100. So year-to-date, the Dow Jones Industrial is up. 10.7 percent in the s p 500 is up 11.3 and you know it's not you're not hard pressed to find out why the market is up so much because there are so many things that are going on that are driving this and i'm just going to cap some of them and but the stocks were up this year the s p is higher by 12 percent as i said last week's economic and corporate data uh, shows incredible progress that the economy has made in a rel- relatively short amount of time and that's been driven by the uh, two rounds of stimulus payments and the ongoing progress. Three stimulus payments. Three, three now. That's, well, the third one's in, in, in house, I guess, right now. No, it's already gone out. Oh, it did pass? Okay. Yeah. Uh, we're, we're going to the fourth one then. Um, they, they want the fourth one. But but the thing is, you got to remember that in March of last year, the market was down 34%. That's right. And so, yes, we're up a whole bunch, but the market was down 34% so just a year ago, we're March. Making, we're making great comeback. Yes. We're making a great comeback. But... Um, the first quarter GDP grew at 6.4%, and the rising earnings from the the, um, the, the stock market companies, uh, the S&P 5 companies that have reported so far, 87% are beating estimates by a historically elevated 24%. Uh, but then again, they were down last year, March. They are. You have but, to keep it in perspective. I know. but uh, And then we have this uh, really great stimulus program that we're using, <laughs> throwing money around like drunken sailors. And uh, but you know there's 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 a a little bit of a caution that you need to have, and when you're looking at this, you know, growth rates might start peaking sometimes later, maybe this quarter, maybe a little bit later, um, but it's going to happen. There's no way we can keep going at this rate. So if, if you're going to think that I'm going to throw all my money in here because you want you haven't saved enough in the past, and you start throwing money into the stock market, you know, because it's hot right because now. Because it's hot. Yeah. That's that is the trend. That's what people do. It's a natural instinct. And don't think you're alone if you're one of them. Uh, just know that if you're watching it on your own, you need to really be watching it. Because when it takes a turn, it takes a turn quickly. And you need to be able to uh, react, which is what we do at Rosenberg Financial Group. Uh, we we, uh, we mitigate risk. We have an active portfolio manager who looks at our, our holdings all the time. And when risk is high, we move out of the market. So. Or when it's in a... And you have you have uh, rotation by sector too. That's We're going right. to have sector rotation. So we've been predominantly in technology, healthcare, and consumer discretionary. And at some point, that's going to rotate into something else. And so, anyways, so and, come yeah. see us if you want to. And um, to give you some local happenings here. Uh, oh yeah, the Grand. I got an email last night. They're reopening, and if you go to their website, they have a. Uh, they're asking you to vote on what you would like to watch at the Grand. Mm-hmm. They'll, have, they'll have a movie night. And so there's like 10 different movies you can vote on. 
and I think I voted for the Night of the Walking Dead or something like that. That'd be kind of fun to watch on a large screen. Um, we got First Friday next weekend, so you know I encourage you if you've been cooped up at home, get out. You know, and you can wear a mask if you want to, but right. hardly anybody else is. That's right. But get out, get some fresh air, have some fun, and maybe meet somebody new. Everyone downtown right now is just looking for someone to talk to. And we talked to, last night. We went out to uh, sushi, and on the way back, we must have talked to twenty different people. You know, and, and it's just a lot of fun. If you're willing to talk and pet stop, people's dogs, oh yeah, yeah, that's how I, I love my, petting other people's dogs. Me too. We have cats, <laughs> so I get my dog fixed when I go out in the in public. <laughs> but look, there's a new there's a new Italian restaurant that's opening up on Cotton Avenue, and its grand opening is this coming Friday, the seventh. And, and it looks beautiful. It is beautiful, and it's called La Bella Vita, which means the good life. And it's, like I said, it's on Cotton Avenue. And it's next to Z Beans, kind of just a couple doors down, I think. Yeah, there used to be an old Chinese restaurant yes, there. It, this has replaced that, and it just is fabulous looking. Beautiful. And, you know, if you have a, a large group, they have, I didn't know, did not know this existed in this building, but there's a very large meeting room in the back. Uh, if you have a large group and you wanted to go there and, and, and have a good Italian lunch with a meeting or something, might be the place to go. So I encourage you to check it out. All right. Sherry, um, I think you wanted to talk about, say, uh, a medical story, didn't you? Yeah, so we're on the phone with Randy's sister, who's who lives in Boston, God bless her, uh, with snow and and ma- very liberal politics. And <laughs> every, every time I talk to her in the winter, I'm so happy to Golly, live in Georgia. Golly, driving an hour in the snow to work every day, except they've been, she's been working from home, but now they're, they're opening back up. She's in charge of concerts. And so they've been on hold, and I honestly was scared that they were going to just lose their shorts and she was going to be out of a business or out of a job. But they've managed to hang on through this whole mess, and they're opening back up. They just have to socially distance. They, there's, their standards out there are so tough, but she's going to be okay. So her husband is from Sweden. His parents live in Sweden. And um, so she was telling us how his mother is flying to the United States next week to have a procedure and I said, what? She goes, she needs knee replacement. I said, why is she coming here? They have socialized health care. It's supposed to be this wonderful free program. And she goes, no, she turned 80. And the older she, she was on the list for a year and a half. And then she turned eight. You have to be on this list. And it's priority based on need. So because she's old, she's the last on the list. Well, she turned 80. And they bumped her out another year. Even though she was already on the list. Yes, she was already on the list. But because she's <laughs> 80, she's not a priority because she's old. So you, you're, so you don't understand what you have in this country. People do not understand how good we have it. And then she was going to go see an eye doctor, too, while she's here because she can't even get in to get an eye exam over there. Well, you know, this, this couple, they, they have some wealth. Yes. But that does not mean they're getting medical attention. They can't there. buy it. They cannot they buy can't it. Pay, if they have enough money, they could go pay to have knee replacement, but they can't even literally get into a place to get it That's done. That's right. And So they, they're paying cash here to get it done. They they maintained for the longest time, while they were in, in much better health, a place in Miami, Florida, that they would come in once a year, have their doctor appointment scheduled, and come to the American doctors. I mean, as, as much as people gripe about American medical and the prices and everything – it's a lot better than the socialized medicine that they have in, in that utopian socialized area that they're living in now in Sweden. Yep. Anyways, so I've got, we had a caller, no, not a caller, an email. And this is very good, and this guy needs help. So maybe somebody out there can help this person. So he says um, he has a mom. He's looking for home caregivers, and he lives in Jones County. And I had talked on uh, on the radio show a few weeks ago about one of my clients had home caregivers around the clock for fifty grand a year, and he co- he emailed me. He's like, "Where did you find these people? Because I'm not finding anybody." And he looked into caring companions and home instead because they advertise, but they don't do anything in Joe's ca- Jones County. They can't refer him to anybody. Mm. He has no one to talk to about how to find good caregivers for his mother. And if you have any idea of how to help this guy, email me, Sherry, S-H-E-R-R-I at rfmoney.com. And, um, pl- and I will relay all of your information directly to him because I have his email address. But it's, it's really stressful. He's gotten to a point where he's got to get some help because he's been doing it and he can't, he can't do, he can't keep doing what he's doing. And I see this a lot, but to not be able to find or get referrals to good people is, is stressful. And the other part of it is that I have, I've had folks who have caregivers and their children are involved and the person that needs care doesn't like the caregivers. Mm. And so, I had one I had one family 
they would literally watch the caregiver walk up the sidewalk, and the person would be like, she's not going to work. That was, of, that was my granddad, Jaeger. Oh, really? Yes, he did exactly the same thing. I don't recall any yep. of that. I mean, he, he fired so many within two minutes of them being in the house. Didn't like the way they looked. Didn't like what they said. How they Didn't spoke. like how they dressed. Right. Didn't like what they, anything. That's right. And they're like, so then you start all over again getting another person. Yep. And I had, I don't can't remember who this client was, but they were just in a nightmare of this and because they could not find anybody that was acceptable mm -hmm. to be in the house. And the person's going to be in your house eight hours a day, at least. And so you got to be comfortable with this person being in all your stuff. That's right. And I, I can't even imagine, honestly, I wonder if I'll be like that. You're already that way. <laughs> I'm going to be a nightmare. You're going to be a nightmare. <laughs> yeah, yeah. You're, you're going to be on the no contact list for all these care Oh, my homes. gosh. I, I, yeah. I hadn't thought about it like that. I'm going to be a nightmare. You know, well, I, I mean. Sucks to be you. Yes, it does. <laughs> <laughs> That's why we have a good long-term care policy. <laughs> yeah, but those people better watch out, too. That's right. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, if none of them want to work with you, they'll be like, it's back on you, Mr. Goss. <laughs> oh, gosh. That's funny. Yeah, I'm kind of picky about a lot of stuff. Okay, so chip shortages. This is really big in the news right now, but you may not have heard about it because I don't know if the, I don't know what mainstream media is covering because I don't watch any of it. I just read news online I thought, every day. I thought Lays was putting out plenty of chips. Oh, Yes, they're expanding the plant down uh, in yes. down in uh, Perry, Georgia. They're hiring 120 people right now. Good luck for that. Are you talking about those kind of chips? Nope. Oh. <laughs> so, uh, semiconductors, they're the microchips that make electronics work. And modern cars are full of electronics requiring hundreds of semiconductors in every mm -hmm. new vehicle. This is just the first of four headwinds fa facing the automotive industry, which is a shortage of chips. The problem began when manufacturing facilities around the world shut down to limit the spread of COVID-19. And this applies to you if you're out looking to buy a vehicle right now. You want to go buy a new vehicle, this might be a reason to put it off for a little bit and let this, let this wave flatten or curve flatten back out. Uh, because I didn't go online. I meant to go to um, a couple of websites and see if price inflation has really happened, that there is a shortage, which usually means that prices are going to be up. Uh, so you might want to delay an, a new car purchase. The problem began when manufacturing facilities around the world shut down to limit the spread of the COVID-19 virus. This disruption caused a kink in the... Sim I can't stop thinking about the caregiver thing and who's going to take care of me if you can't. I can't stop thinking about this and how this is going to be so difficult. <laughs> I hope Preston's not listening. <laughs> <laughs> oh, my gosh. He's going to be stuck with me. Anyways, sorry. I was distracted. Uh, the problem began when manufacturing facilities around the world shut down to limit the spread of the COVID-19 virus. This disruption caused a kink in the semiconductor supply chain. At the same time, automakers around the world closed their factories in an attempt to protect their workers and flatten the curve of COVID-19 infections. They canceled orders for materials, parts, and electronics across the board. And just like our son running the automotive shop, he doesn't keep parts in, in stock anymore. He's on the phone, they're on the phone with O'Reilly's or whoever if, every 15 minutes ordering parts because you buy parts real time. You don't have this, in, you don't have this giant uh, shed full right. of all this stuff. And that's how manufacturers operate the same exact way. Today's vehicles use semiconductors in almost everything, including the engine, transmission, brakes, cruise control, steering wheel, power seats, airbag sensors, front and rear cameras, side mirrors, driver assistance features, entertainment systems, and more. In, in all, uh, new vehicles have around 200 to 400 semiconductors apiece. So there was a sharp drop-off in orders. Meanwhile, the world moved to the home economy and the quarantine. Need for the demand for new computers, smartphones, and modems, at home entertainment products like TVs, tablets, and video game consoles went through the roof. Semiconductor makers saw the opportunity as the auto industry cut back orders. Chip makers shifted their production capacity toward consumer electronics. China has been stockpiling semiconductors for fear of trade restrictions on top of it all. The entire world is suffering from a massive shortage, and there's no quick fix. Semiconductors have a long build time to begin with, roughly 26 weeks. Automakers rely on just-in-time inventory management, as I just mentioned. They buy components from part manufacturers as needed and keep minimal inventory. Most major automakers worldwide are now having trouble sourcing semiconductors to the point that they're cutting production and idling plants. 
At this point, automakers expect the semiconductor shortage to continue into at least the second half of the year. They expect the shortage to cost the industry roughly $61 billion in sales over the course of the year. And the prices are going up. Uh, other vehicle components are rising as well. Since May 2020, steel prices are up 182%. Aluminum is up 58%. Copper is up 83%. Um, and, you know, and you know what all this is going to create is a um, higher prices for cars and trucks. Because if they can't get the chips, they can't make the cars, they can't make the trucks. And so what's on the showroom floor right now? It's going to get a premium. You get a premium. That's what I'm saying. I'd, I'd put up buying something. Uh, since last May, the yield on the Treasury is up more than two and a half times from 0.61 to 1.5%. A higher interest rate on government bonds means a higher interest rate on corporate debt, home mortgages, and, of course, auto loans. So higher interest rates makes vehicles less affordable. Household debt is at 14 point. Now, this is this is bizarre. Household debt is at 14.6 trillion, its highest level ever. Delinquencies on debt like credit cards and car loans are near multi-year highs, even with all this stimulus. That's right. All this stimulus going on. What is, are people doing out there? Well, I'll tell you, um, some of them probably catching up on, on back bills just to keep the roof over their head. That was part of what was going on. But there's another article that we've got that talks about where, what people are doing a large portion of what people are doing with their stimulus checks, and we'll get to that in just a little while. Yep. Delinquencies on credit cards and car loans are near multi-year highs. More than 9% of all credit card debt and 4% of auto loans delinquent by 90 days or more, even though you're, you're getting paid not to work. And if the stimulus keeps flowing, inflation is going to go much higher, and the checks will be stimulus checks will be less effective. So, very interesting what's going on in the whole world. The whole world is being affected by this. At least uh, the United States is once again leading the way. We pay more out in uh, stimulus checks than any other nation in the world. Go USA! Right. You know, you're talking about the uh, the auto industry, Sherry, and one of the things that that also also people need to consider is one with all these chips in the cars you know think about if one component goes out in your car the cost is going to go behind that just to 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 replace it yeah i know a, a uh, preston recently had a uh that's a car, our son our, a car come in to the shop and the dash was not working the the, the speedometer everything that's not good digital it took thousands of dollars to replace the parts that went into that car but you know there's another thing that they're the auto manufacturers are doing they're making parts that are are uh, correlated with the vin of the car so when someone goes in to get their car fixed if it's a specific car uh, they have to take it to the dealership to get it fixed and that's just going to mean more cost for the consumer so be aware of that yep i just remember this lady that came to see me back 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 a long time ago and she had bought a prius and it had a three-year warranty on it. And it was like three years and three months old, and the entire dash went out. Oh, my gosh. And she took it in. I guess she had a toad in. I don't even know. I can't remember. And it was going to be $5,000 to replace the entire dash. And it was out of warranty, and so she traded it in for a new one. And I'm like, why would you buy another one of those? <laughs> if right. the dash went out and it was five grand, at least, and, and I guess I would get an extended warranty, which is what I did on my car because of all of this. I did an eight-year warranty. Because it's expensive to replace stuff that goes out anymore with all these electronics. It's That's just, right. So I think used car sales are going to go way up with all this craziness going on. It already has. Uh, the number of, you've probably seen in the number of used car dealerships all over the place. Uh, just on the side of the road, you'll see people with for sale signs in the car. And it's real easy to go to a, a create, a, become a, an auto dealer. It's, I won't say easy, but it's not difficult either. Uh a you, lot of hoops to jump through because you guys did it with yeah, Pittman's. we did. And, I mean, it and now about, you're out of it. It took about six months, and we just decided after we got into it that we just didn't have the time for it. But you can go to these local auctions around here and pick up a car for a fairly decent price. And so you can just be an average person and go to one of those places? Some of them, yes. There's one in town that I know that an average person can go to the auction and, and bid. But I believe they are even in the process of curtailing it just to dealers. Hmm. So they could probably demand a premium mm -hmm. or a surcharge or there's something about that. Oh. Yeah, I, th I think some people who go to the auctions, if they're just Joe Q in public and, and they're not, they don't understand the, the values of cars and stuff, they, they run the prices up for the dealers who are standing there trying to, hmm. trying to buy cars. I don't know why they're doing it, but that's just a, not a thought. All I know is I made some really bad choices in the past when I bought a car. <laughs> Very bad choices because I didn't know what I was doing. TR7. Or was that a 6? 
I don't remember. It was it was a piece of junk. It was it was cool looking anyway. Cool looking, yeah. Anyway, so the Economist had a really great article this week about what history tells you about post pandemic booms. This is fascinating. I've only seen it seen it one place, and this will make you feel a little better and give you a sense of why we are all where we are in this country and as a world actually. Mm-hmm. So. There was a pandemic in the early 30s, 1830s, sorry, which hit France very hard. It wiped out nearly 3% of Parisians in a month. Hospitals were overwhelmed by patients whose ailments doctors could not explain as cholera. The end of the plague prompted an economic revival with France following Britain into an industrial revolution. But the pandemic also contributed to another sort of revolution. The city's poor, hit hardest by the disease, fulminated against the rich who had fled the country uh, to avoid contagion. France saw political instability for years afterward. Today, even as COVID rages across poorer countries, the rich world is on the threshold of a post-pandemic boom. As vaccinations reduce hospitalizations and deaths from the virus, governments are lifting stay-at-home orders and loosening rules on social mixing. Many forecasters reckon that America's economy will grow by around 7% this year, roughly 5 percentage points points faster than the pre-pandemic trend of just over 2%. Other countries, but that's also because we went through such a trough. I mean, you go through a trough, you're going to have growth. Other countries are also in for unusually fast growth. The Economist analysis of GDP data for the G7 economies back to 1820 suggests that such a synchronized acceleration relative to trend is rare. It has not happened since the post-war boom of the 1950s. The situation is so unfamiliar that economists are turning to history to get a sense of what to expect. There are three lessons here. First, while people are keen to get out and spend, uncertainty lingers for some time. Second, and I'm seeing this with my clients, I have a few that are getting out there and going out to lunch and shopping, but many are still extremely wary of getting out and even going to a restaurant. I have most of my clients are telling me they've maybe eaten out once or twice in the last year, and they're still not ready to do it. They they just, this thing has just uh, kind of blown them out of the water. Second, the pandemic encourages people and businesses to try new ways of doing things, upending the structure of the economy. Third, as the example of Le Mis, France, shows political upheaval often follows with unpredictable economic consequences. Mm -hmm. Take consumer spending first. Evidence from earlier pandemics suggests that during the acute phase, people behave as they have during the past year of COVID-19, accumulating savings as spending opportunities vanish and it becomes risky to go outside. In the first half of the 1870s, during an outbreak of smallpox, Britain's household saving rate doubled. Japan's saving rate more than doubled during the First World War. And in 1919-20, to 20, as the Spanish flu raged, Americans stashed away more cash than in any subsequent year until the Second World War. When that war hit, saving rose again, with households accumulating additional balances of some 40% of GDP. Mm. It's, it's crazy. History also offers a guide to what people do once life gets back to normal. Spending rises, prompting employment to recover, but there's not much evidence of excess. A recent paper by Goldman Sachs uh, estimates that in 1946 to 1949, American consumers spent only about 20% of their excess savings. Beer consumption actually went down. That's, I, don't, I don't get that one. I don't get that one either, and I don't think that's happening now based on what I see downtown. <laughs> they're, they're making they're, up They're doing right really now. good yeah. right now. Uh, the second big lesson from post-pandemic booms relates to the supply side of the economy, how and where goods and services are produced. This is big. Though in aggregate people appear to be less keen on frivolous fun following a pandemic, some may be more willing to try new things or new ways of making money. Historians believe the Black Death made Europeans more adventurous. Piling onto a ship and setting sail for new lands seemed less risky when so many people were already dying at home. Right. Isn't that interesting? Mm -hmm. A study for American's National Bureau of Economic Research published in 1948 found that the number of startups boomed from 1919. Today, new business formation is once again surging across the rich world as entrepreneurs seek to fill gaps in the market. This is your whole crisis equals opportunity. This is what this what happens. This is what we do. We see some pro- a problem, and everybody runs to try to fix it and make money off at the same time, and, and that's just exposed a lot of problems. 
Other economists have drawn a link between pandemics and another change to the supply side of the economy, the use of labor-saving technology. Bosses may want to limit the, limit the spread of disease, and robots do not fall ill. A paper by researchers at the IMF says pandemic events accelerate robot adoption. The 1920s were also an era of rapid automation in America, and there is as yet little hard evidence of a surge in automation because of COVID, though anecdotes abound of robots springing up. And they're missing a point here. So we have ordering online, pick up, telehealth, pick up groceries, you know, call it, you order your coffee online and go through a drive through. We don't have total automation, but we have changed a lot. Digital payments, remote work, distance learning. I mean, there's a lot that has shifted. And so we don't have robots yet, right. but, but we're not far away. Online entertainment, uh, supply change. Uh, you just told me that. Whether automation deprives people of jobs, however, is another matter. And some research suggests that workers, in fact, do better in the aftermath of a pandemic. Uh, because pay goes up because you have a shortage of workers, typically, historically. In other cases, however, rising wages are the product of political change. The third big lesson of historical boom periods. Policymakers across the world are relatively less interested in reducing public debt or warding off inflation than they are in getting unemployment down. That is the ticket. Yeah, that is. A new paper from three academics at the London School of Economics has found COVID-19 has made people across Europe more averse to inequality. That's, and that's historically been the truth. And it's, and it's going on again right now. Such pressures have, in some instances, exploded into political disorder. Pandemics expose and accent, accentuate pre-existing inequalities. Recent research from the IMF considers the effect of five pandemics, including Ebola, SARS, and Zika in 133 countries since 2001, and it finds that they led to a significant increase in social unrest. It is reasonable to expect that, as the pandemic fades, unrest may re-emerge in locations where it previously existed. Social unrest may not peak, or it seems to peak, sorry, two years after the pandemic ends. Isn't that crazy? That is crazy. Yeah, but people see, and so here's um, here's the the problem with this. So the more money is spent on and dole and just handouts, the more frustration people are going to have because they're going to feel I didn't get mine. You got you had something and I didn't get it. And I think the more that our government throws money around, I think the worse they're going to create a situation of inequality and frustration. I, I think that's true. Uh, you know. I just saw an article yesterday after, after Biden's six billion or trillion dollars worth of stimulus that he's put out there. Right. Uh, some of the, the more left leaning are already criticizing him for not giving more and coming and funding all these you know good ideas that they have. And it just I just wanted to scream. It's just like what are you thinking here? You know, there, someone has to make the money to pay these bills, and it's going to be you, you know, and me and right. our listeners out there. Was, was that the end of that article by any chance? It was because okay. I'm, I'm sick of it. Okay. Well, <laughs> it is the halftime show. So um, I'd like to say that you're listening to Your Money with Randy and Sherry Goss. Becca is and Steve are on vacation uh, this weekend. And, uh, she didn't say that. Okay. Re redact that, would you? Okay. Uh, <laughs> But anyway, everyone needs a vacation. Anyway, um, we are with Rosenberg Financial Group. We have offices in Macon and Warner Robins. We are fee-based financial planners. And if you'd like to call into the show today at 742-0940, we have John and Danica listening to us. And they just reminded me a second ago with a text that they are listening to it on their app. So if you'd like to tune in on one of the, the apps, you can you can hear us from anywhere in the world. So, Or you can say, Alexa, AM 940. That's right. <laughs> or you can say, Alexa, AM 9... No, Alexa. I didn't say that. Alexa, AM 940. So. Anywho. All righty. So, saving and investing when you're just starting out. You want to right. take this? Sure. Um, you know, this this article and this, this information that we're going to pass on to you, you may be beyond this. And if so, that's great. Just bear with us because what, we're, what we have here is some good information that... You can pass on to your grandkids, you know, to your please, kids. Please, please do this, you, you know, because a lot of a lot of people they just jump right into it and they 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 get their first big paycheck and they blow every dime of it. Now, if you get if you spend years in college, you know, I get it. 
go have some fun, some fun with maybe the first couple of paychecks you've got, all right? But sign up for the 401k. S- settle down, think about the long term because we all have goals and that's what this is all about. So, um this is about saving and investing when you're just getting it, started. It is, but you know I, I I wanted to say too that these ideas here go beyond just that. So if you're if you have a business, some of these ideas go to that too because one of the first things that people always tell you if you're starting a business is to pay yourself first okay that's the first thing and what we're talking about here is go ahead and set yourself up a budget and figure out what it is that you want to to, to spend your money on so if you're going to start getting a new a new big paycheck you know you're going to have rent you're probably going to have a vehicle uh you know you student put in loans. student loans you put in your utilities and all this stuff but you know, you have some choices about where you live and the, and the car that you drive. So if part of your thinking going in is, I need to be putting money into retirement, so I need to make sure that's a one of the top items in my, my budget. So then you can work backwards into how much of a, a rent you want to pay and how much car you, that you go and buy. Not everyone needs to be driving a Mercedes directly out of, of, of uh, college. Barely anybody needs that. That's right. And you see it all the In time. In fact, it's not a need at all. That's right. It's a want. So, But anyway, pay yourself first. Uh, invest your savings prudently because once you get out into the workforce and you start making money, your peers that are there with you who have gone to school and everything, they, they start looking at the stock market and, and guess what? They all have good ideas. And a lot of times, these good ideas—they're just chasing, they're they're chasing dreams and 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 you know good ideas from somebody else that they've talked to, and they just. Or they're terrified, like our son. Okay, so our son, he gets a job on the base, uh, contract. What was he? He was a, a technician. Technician, and so I said, "You're putting money in the TSP, right?" And he goes, "Yeah." I said, "What fund are you in?" He goes, "I'm in the G fund because everybody tells me that everything's going to hell in a handbasket." I said, "Preston." get in the C that, fund that for God's a, sakes you're 21 years old you've got your whole life and you're gonna buy shares and then when the market goes down you'll buy more shares that's a, that's a perfect example Sherry because uh, but there's also the converse to that too somebody will say oh you know you should get this stock because it's a hot tip right now they're gonna give you that hot stock tip because people love to do that they do and you can lose your money really really easily so uh, the next thing here is appreciate your greatest gift, and that is time. Just as Sherry said, when you're young, you should be, uh, you know, your risk tolerance has a lot to do with it, granted. But when you're young, you should trust an advisor. Take, get, take Yeah, get every, some every plan has an advisor. That's right. Call so, them and, and talk to them. Yep, and I advise you, you know, find somebody local. You know, that, that, well, if you have an inner plan, there's an advisor for the plan. That's right. That's correct. But anyway, if, here's, here's some other tips. You know, like I said earlier, establish your goals. You know, don't be afraid to dream. And you can dream big. But just remember, if you start dreaming big, you need to be saving big as well. Okay? Uh, I said map out your budget so you know what your, your, your whole budget is. You can, you can make yourself wealthy by making the right decisions early in life. Okay? Um, understand your risk tolerance. As I said, find the right brokerage account that one that fit, fits for you you know you, you might want something that's just completely on your telephone you don't have a you don't go see a live person you you can do it yourself um but a lot of people need that real person that they can go get in front of and the other thing is you want to take a look at what the fees are that are being charged and for god's sakes if you're going to get a match on your 401k sign up now that's right that was my next thing is the retirement plan when you get a match as sherry just said that is free money that's a hundred percent return instantly and the other thing is it's pre-tax that's right and so you're saving money right off the bat because you're you're making money and saving money at the same time yeah. i mean it's it's a huge and, and you know Sherry, on that on that note everyone really should understand the retirement plans that they're in not just throw money into it blindly but understand what's there understand what they're investing in what the each of those plans the programs invest in themselves you know here's an example you can go out and look at mutual funds and etfs and go oh that one look at the returns that one has made you know wow i'm gonna put my money there not every year is going to be the same you know every there the ups and downs all the time but you might not like to say have tobacco stocks you know you might have a, a social aversion to those kind of stocks so if you're putting your money into an etf or a, or a mutual fund what if those have that you know you might want to make a, another choice i mean you, you get what i'm saying sherry so 
uh, take a look at what's the underlying securities that go into it and mix it up. Uh, don't just invest in one sector or one stock. And here's an example. My brother and his wife, he worked for WorldCom. And mm. he put every bit of his uh, money in his. I mean, he had the the option of putting it into a four hundred one k. I've forgotten about this. Yeah, or you could buy. You you could take your what they were going to pay you in company stock, and he put everything into it. And WorldCom just Blew imploded, up. and they lost everything. I mean, house the whole nine yards. So, um, I think that's enough of this one. Okay, let me see here. I got some more, baby. Hang on. Oh, yeah. The last thing I wanted to say on this, though, was don't react to the stock market. Okay? Unless you're getting ready to retire. That's right. <laughs> when, you're, when, when, you're, when you're young. Disclosure, disclosure. Yes. When, when you are young, uh, you don't need to be looking at your, your portfolio every day. You know, I encourage you to stay on it and look at it. Maybe you have to fine tune it every now and then. But. If you're going to look at it every day, you're going to drive yourself nuts. And if you react to it, if it's a down market, you know, and say, I'm selling out everything, you may have just sold uh, when the market is at the low point and you're going to lose money. Because when you have to go buy back in, you may miss that side of it as well. I have to say something here, though, because most people are not going to do any of these things. They might take advice from somebody or the advisor of the plan. The plan advisors hardly show up at all anymore to help you, so you have to hunt them down if you need advice. Uh, if you want, so either you have to look at it or bring it to us, Steve, me, or Becca, and let us look at it and see based on your age, based on what you're doing based on how much you're putting in and all of that, and we'll, we'll give you free advice on that. Co sorry, complimentary, complimentary. Uh, consultation and Warner Robins are making, but not very few people have the desire to look at this kind of data. Well, the, and that's a big problem. And back in the day, I remember back when I was at Consumer Credit Counseling Service, we had two financial advisors that would come once a year. We had mandatory meetings we had to sit through, and they would do a presentation of what's going on and all the funds and blah, blah, blah. And then we got to meet with them individually for like an up to an hour. We got an appointment. We got a. They've done. Everybody's done away with that because of the of the the whole pullback, and they don't want to be liable and responsible for what they tell you to do because they only see you once a year. Well, that's one piece of it, but the other piece is you have uh, a, a real young crowd right now. The millennials they do things differently. A lot of these folks take. Uh, they they're on Reddit every day. They're on these different uh, Moo Moo or whatever these different apps that that they can go and do their own investing. And if they get in, just use Preston as an example, he goes and does that all the time. But he also gets under the hood of a car for half a day. And if he's not watching it and the stock market starts doing weirdness and going down, he's going to miss it. Somebody, you need to have somebody who's watching your plan for you. So, but at the same time, he's young and he shouldn't worry about it to the point where he's making himself sick like he was for a while. So anyway, uh, you get what we're saying here. So anyway, if you if you uh, have somebody that's young, that that still has a mind full of mush, as Rush Limbaugh like to used to like to say, you know, educate them on how they should be doing business. Help them out. Yep. Because they may be afraid to bring it up because they feel ignorant. That's a big problem in this entire thing. Yep. Did you still want to talk about this? Yeah, like just 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 something I, I saw the other day. You know, there's a lot of adages that go around the stock market, and one since we're just going into May. One of the old adages used to be, sell in May and go away. And Where did that come from? Well, that came out of, um, I had to look this one up. This one goes all the way back to the London Financial District. Uh, when aristocrats, bankers, and merchants would sell their stocks in May, escape the summer heat and go on vacation, and then return just in time for the, the big horse race that they had over there. But you have to understand, when you, when you hear people say things like this, you know, the, the stock market does not necessarily re react to a calendar date at all. Okay? Right. So they did this for comfort more than anything else. For their own, for their own safety. So they That's could just right. check out. That's right. We can't check out. All right. Onward um, and upward. Yep. So let's see here. Oh, gosh. What was I going to say? Biden, Biden, Biden. <laughs> um, okay. So let me get this. I'm not going to keep... Uh, sorry, I got lost in my in my notes here. The next thing I had is what keeps the affluent up at night. I'm going to skip that because I want to get into the meat of some other things. So there's a lot of 
the plans being thrown around and a lot of money being thrown around. And most of the people I meet with every day are extremely concerned because they see the ideas behind the money being thrown around and they're not comfortable with uh, the decisions that are being made out of the White House. So I want to give you a little backstory on some of these. So uh, number one on my list, I'm looking, Randy. Okay. Reduce carbon emissions by tw by 50 percent. So Biden says he's going to reduce carbon emissions by 50 percent from the year 2005 to 2035. So I looked it up, and there's a website you can go to called Statista.com. And you want to go to the phones? Yeah, let's uh, let's go to the phones first. Good morning, you're on with Randy and Sherry. Morning. Good morning. Good morning. You were talking about cars. Yes. yes. Prices going up. I need to buy a used car. Is there any kind of a service where somebody that knows how to do that kind of thing that I could pay him for a finder's fee for a good car? I would look up, um, you can Google auto brokers, and they can help you find the car that you're looking for. And then and before you buy it, take it to a mechanic and have a total right. work over done. It may have them look at everything and make sure there's nothing wrong. And if you if you Google you know, auto break brokers, you know, yeah. you'll have to sift through it, and they'll probably give you the names of a bunch of them. Do some really good research on those those companies to make sure that they have a good record in the community as well. And then Clark Howard has an, a special report on his website, which is Clark.com, and it's seven steps to buying a used car, and it's very good. He right. walks you through the whole thing of going to Consumer Reports and looking at models, makes and models and mm -hmm. reliability, and then going out and shopping based on, like Carfax and all, not Carfax, but Cars.com, going to websites and searching for those cars and comparing prices, and then going out. He, he advises buying it online. I, there's no way I would buy a car online. I have to sit in it and drive it and see what it's it's like I just I can't imagine doing that but it's it's a really hard thing that's why I kept my last last car 12 years because I hate buying cars now I, I will tell you too that the one thing you might want to be cautious of is is you know if if you have an auto broker many of them will find out what it is that you're looking for they'll do a you know a real good question and answer session with you and then they are going to go to the auto auctions and try to find one now a lot of the cars that go to the auto auctions are because they didn't sell on the dealer's lots during trade-in or there's some mechanical issues. I'm, I'm always kind of wary. Every car that we purchased from the auto auctions, there was always some issue that we had to take into the mechanic shop and fix. So be be cautious there. And, you know, a lot of the cars, are, I know they're some, sometimes more expensive uh, when they're sitting on the, the dealer's lots. They are usually, they've usually been run through a a multi-point inspection so I trust that a little better than some of the the fly-by-night uh, it's not fly-by-night the the smaller places so does that help you any yeah that helped a lot uh, it's just really hard and I really that's one I hate doing that more than buying a house yeah literally yeah. it's my most least my least favorite thing to have to even think about Especially when you go into, say, a dealership, uh, and, and you go, okay, I don't think I want this you know, anymore, and, and I, I'm, I'm going to get out of here. Uh, and then they bring in, oh, hang on a second, let me get the manager. Maybe he can do something for you. And then they come and put the high-pressure sale on you. I hate that. So, yeah. Well, I have, to, I have to do a plug for Walsh Honda, because we went on their lot, and they didn't pressure us to do anything. Mm -hmm. And I, I had the best experience. Now, I bought a new car which is the guy made some money, and so he was real happy about that. But there was no pressure in any direction from anybody about anything. And here's the most amazing part. So I take the car in for an oil change, first time, never been in there before. I'm sitting in the waiting room, and there's other people sitting there, and there's this lady sitting there across from me. And the guy that did... The, that looked at her car comes in and he said, ma'am, we were going to do a this for you, but now this is not working. And so there's no point in us replacing this part when you actually need this part and another part. And here's what we would charge for this. And if you want to go shop around and shop other places to get this done, here's the price of what we would charge. Right. And it's totally up to you. And I about yeah. fell out of my chair. <laughs> and then he came to, there's another old old guy sitting across from me and this, the, another one comes out, a service writer comes out and says, mister, we were going to do this for you, but I wanted to tell you, Here's what it's going to cost. And so if you want to shop around, you're free to do that, or we can do it right now. But if you want to shop elsewhere, I've never – I went to the manager. I said, I've never seen this in my life right. of somebody being blatantly honest about what – instead of just lying to you and trying to overcharge you. Well, I bought my last truck at Jeff Smith Ford down in Byron, 
and it was a used vehicle and I, I was kind of a little on the fence there and, and so the the, the uh, finance manager did come in but what we ended up coming out of was a much better way for me to have traded my my current truck in and get this other one hmm. so I mean there are some advantages of having the service not service manager the the finance manager come in because they do understand the 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 workings of an auto loan mm. and it, it worked out really well so you know um i wish you luck in your your yeah. your search i'm glad it's you and not me now uh, <laughs> <laughs> so yeah let us know how it goes yeah call us back and let, give us the okay, the good the bad and the ugly yay I appreciate the help thank you thank, thank you. you bye Bye. All right, so carbon emissions. So he's going to reduce carbon emissions uh, because it's on a piece of paper that he wrote. <laughs> uh, why can't I see number one? Okay, carbon by 50% from 2005 to 2035. So guess what I did? I went out and found a chart. So Statista, Statista.com has charts of all sorts of things. And this chart is U.S. carbon dioxide emissions from 1975 to 2020. So energy consumption in the United States produced 4.57 million metric tons of carbon dioxide emissions in 2020. This was a reduction of 13% compared to the previous year. Although emissions from energy consumption have been on decline for a number of years, the dramatic decline in 2020 was caused by COVID, which heavily disrupted industry and travel. Mm -hmm. So if you look at the graph, 2005 is at the peak of carbon emissions. Right. So somebody in the White House found this chart and said, hey, let's say that we can reduce carbon emissions 50% from 2005 because that's when the peak was. And guess what? We're already today down 24% since 2005. So we only have to do 26% to get to the 50%, which there's – they can – I mean – I, when, they, when they say that they've hit the target, I'm pulling this chart again <laughs> and calling the you-know-what flag. Well, well, you know, they did the same thing when it came to COVID vaccinations because when, when um, Biden was elected his first day, he goes, yeah, uh, we want to get 400,000 immunizations a day in, in the next, you know, right now. Anyway, it was already being done at that rate. So I love how they, they take the statistics and make, make them work for it. But it's not just Biden. Every politician does it. They so. all do it. So the next thing I want to talk about is your bank accounts, because this affects everybody. Oh, boy. And I'm trying to see where this is on my sheet, and I'm not finding it. I wish I made a copy of this for you so you could be helping me. Anyways, so um, I'll just read the article. So under the Biden plan, the IRS would know a lot more about your bank accounts, and this is part of the American Families Plan that he is promoting. It would increase IRS enforcement, which is going to be going up. He's going to pay an extra $80 billion. Yep. 80 billion to the IRS to increase enforcement uh, by increasing and by increasing reporting obligations for financial institutions and by raising taxes on the wealthy. And this affects our firm as yes, well. It does. Yes, it does. This column will focus on what a senior administration official called one of the significant steps designed to make sure that taxpayers are paying the taxes they already owe, increasing reporting obligations for financial institutions. So this American Families Plan calls for banks and other financial institutions to report more than just a taxpayer's interest earned, capital gains and losses. Banks and other financial institutions would also be required to report aggregate account outflows and inflows. Can you imagine what a nightmare this is? It's going to be an accounting nightmare, and every individual is going to have to really tighten up on how they th their records. You know, yes. if you put ten dollars into your your account, you better show where it came from. In other words, the IRS will know about all of your bank accounts, whether you earned income on that account or not, how much is in the account on a given year, and how much was transferred in and out of the account. It is unclear how this would work, but what is clear is that this new reporting obligation will create a massive compliance effort on the part of financial institutions. You know, Sherry, just I just thought of this. This is going to get to the point where we don't have to do taxes anymore the irs will just come to you and say you owe this amount of money well you still have to show all the other stuff you have going on that's not a bank account thing. they're going to know everything that's what they're after mm. the irs's lack of information about the balance of the business account how much was deposited and how much was withdrawn allows the self-employed taxpayer to lie or make an honest mistake about gross receipts or gross revenue for some self-employed taxpayers this temptation is hard to resist. Cheating on taxes by taking outlandish deductions is likely to end up in an IRS audit, but under-reporting revenue is harder to track or identify. 
By requiring banks to report highest balances and aggregate deposits and withdrawals, the American Families Plan will effectively close off the option of underreporting gross receipts or revenues. So the place where they can't get this is if somebody writes you a check and you cash it. That's right. They, they can't track that because you're not deposit. They're talking about deposits and exi- and the, whatever withdrawals. So uh, let me see here. And here's the problem too: if a business owner uh, can say, "So I have a business account. My income goes into my business account, and then I run payroll, and that payroll goes into our personal account." So there's I'm not doing anything wrong. No. Nope. And so I don't understand why they'd be looking at this. And I don't know how they're going to find anything wrong by look. I don't understand what they're going after here. So it means cheating on taxes by taking out landish deductions is likely to end up in an IRS audit, but underreporting revenue is harder to track or identify. By requiring banks to report highest balances and aggregate deposits and withdrawals, the American Families Plan will effectively close off the option of underreporting gross receipts or revenues for businesses and self-employed taxpayers. I think this is going to drive everything back to the the trade you know you the barter system and in a large ways i mean look, I don't at, know. look at the people who come out and cut the grass you know say your house or something you know if they're a big company you might have them set up on to get paid by a check but a lot of guys ride around with a lawnmower in the truck and you pay them cash i mean it's like i don't know i don't know where this is headed uh it may create problems however that should be considered and addressed as this plan works its way through congress for example consider a young couple saving up to buy a home all savings are put into a dream home savings account then when it comes time to make the down payment the fifty thousand dollar dream home savings goes into the regular checking account which is then wired to the seller's escrow account buying a home is not a taxable event at least for federal income tax but selling one is will the irs receive information from the institution that leads to an audit because you did that Conversely, say the young couple receives a down payment as a gift from their parents. If the parents gifted $50,000 to the adult children to make a down payment, that must be reported on a gift tax return, even though no gift tax is due. This type of gift is frequently made, and in my practice as a tax lawyer, rarely reported as it should be. The increased financial reporting obligation would likely increase compliance with gift tax reporting rules. The Biden administration and Congress should work together to ensure that taxpayers who simply move funds between accounts are not audited solely as a result of their proposed increased financial reporting. I mean, this is a disaster. It is a disaster. And it's going to be a waste of money. No, I, I get... You know, $80 billion. Yeah, I get them trying to make people um, who are cheating on taxes. I get that, and I applaud that. But don't make it so much more difficult for the the... the the people who are not cheating. I mean, they can. They should be able to take a look at the tax returns, historic tax returns, and know which the ones these people are. You know, right? Like, uh, Anyways, so I'm going to just run down the fast list of all this stuff I've been reading all week. So on Friday, the Senate passed a 35 billion dollar water bill, which is supposed to fix water infrastructure over the next five years. Um, they want uh, so. So the the child tax credit is now being paid to families on a monthly basis, and they want to continue that for five years now. That's in a bill. Uh, they want a fourth stimulus check. They want to expand Medicare to age 50. Uh, this passed. This is already done deal. Free meals for th- – what could go wrong with this? Free meals for 34 million kids this summer. And what they're going to do is take $7 per kid per day and put it on the parent's EBT card to get the kids food. If the parents aren't using the EBT card to buy food already, the seven dollars is going to go somewhere else. I think going back to what we said earlier, beer <laughs> consumption's down. I think we might see some more. Beer sales. <laughs> just, just me thinking out. Eliminate the step up on cost basis to date of death value, which is the worst thing ever. Increase capital gains tax. Reduce the cost of Obamacare for fourteen million people, which are now only paying twenty dollars for it. Um, Fifteen dollar first time home buyer credit. That's a bill. Ten billion dollars. For foreclosure avoidance, that's already passed. Mm-hmm. You can apply for that. Um, let me see. Let me see. It talked about that. Oh, free free preschool, child care, and college infrastructure, which includes pay, paying of care for the elderly. That's part of the infrastructure plan. Is is paying for in home and nursing home care. Pay off student loans if you're in the military. That just came out yesterday. Uh, Ten thirty one exchange. No no longer. A, allowed and i guess we need to close out the show on this happy note <laughs> well he gave us the two minute 
a warning. Golly, I can't get over this. It's like every day I can hardly keep it straight. It took me hours this week to even, I don't even know if I'm on top of it. It's because every news channel only shows, they'll have like one piece of it. And then you have to piece all these pieces together to get your head around it. We were talking to our accountant Friday. Oh. And he he is just beside himself with all the changes that are going on right during the middle of tax season. Oh, it's a nightmare. Yeah, because yeah. yeah, they, now they're sending out refunds for people that paid taxes on their unemployment. That's right. And, you know, <laughs> if they want to really get the people on their side, you know, to everyone be voting Democrat after this, is just cancel tax season this year until that everything settles. Just give everyone a pass. Just give everyone a pass this year. <laughs> <laughs> That's the best way to do it. Just make everything free for a year. Because, I mean... <laughs> We, we saw we saw the accountant and he had a full gray, head of gray hair. You know, it's like it's like didn't you have black hair last year? It's like, anyway, anyway, oh gosh. Anyway, uh, Sherry, uh, how much time do we have left there, CT? Forty seconds. Okay. So well, you've been listening to. Um, Brit- <laughs> You've been listening to something. We're not sure what it was. You've been listening to Your Money on News Talk 940 WMAC. We are Randy and Sherry Goss. We're with Rosenberg Financial Group. We have three financial planners in the office that will see you for an absolutely complimentary consultation. Becca Wilton, myself, or Steve Rosenberg. And we have different programs that we can use to help you. Becca does financial plans, and she'd love to talk to you about that. Um, but anyways, you can learn more about us by going to retirerelax.com. And if you're starting to save for retirement or you're in the middle of closing in on it please check out our special reports they're really good have a wonderful weekend get outside it's beautiful out yep bye the views expressed on the show should not be construed directly or indirectly as an offer to buy or sell any securities or services mentioned herein investing is subject to risk including loss of principal invested past performance is not a guarantee of future results no strategy can assure a profit nor protect against loss please note that individual situations can vary therefore the information should only be relied upon when coordinated with individual professional advice securities are offered through royal alliance associates incorporated member finra and sipc advisory services are offered through rosenberg financial group a registered investor advisor not a Affiliated with Royal Alliance Associates Incorporated. Offices are located at 2517 Moody Road, Warner Robins, and 4875 Riverside Drive, Suite 201 in Macon. Phone numbers are 922-8100 and 741-4457.